So welcome to our second paper session. So the first paper will be presented by Deepika on artificial intelligence. Deepika, can you share your screen? Sure, thank you, uh, Kunyan. Just yeah. give me a minute. Sure. Um, All right, yeah. Um, good evening, everyone. So my name is uh, Deepika Chiller. I'm a third year doctoral student on the macro track of organizational behavior. And I'm very thankful for the opportunity to present a joint work with Professor Ruth Aguilera from Northeastern University who couldn't be here with us uh, because of a family obligation. Um, she conveys her apologies. It is a review paper, um, which is under review as of now and on the topic of artificial intelligence and more specifically on the governance of artificial intelligence. I just realized I do not have my video on so I just see that and let me put this to full slide mode just give me a second. So hopefully this is visible. Um, so primarily our motivation for this paper comes from um, the fact that AI is in increasingly uh, important in our lives, in our social lives, as well as um, the empirical world is gaining importance in the media, in popular media, in popular press, as well as uh, we see increasing number of articles in the scholarly world. So we have, um, we have uh, world leaders like um, Steve Wozniak, Elon Musk, Sundar Pichai, and Bill Gates talking about not just uh, artificial intelligence, but also the governance and the importance of governing AI. Um, I'll just give a minute to read this one. So we, they, they basically they emphasize that we have, as a society, we have to make sure that technology is harnessed for good and it is available to everyone. As Denise also mentioned in one of the earlier um, presentations today, the need to govern AI is um, increasingly important. So getting um, definitions right is very important, not just because um, this is an important phenomenon as per our understanding, but also because um, there are multiple definitions out there. And so we had for the purpose of our paper, we adopt the definition by Kaplan and Hendlin from the Business Horizons article. This is Andreas Kaplan. Um, a system's ability to interpret external data correctly, to learn from such data, and to use these learnings to achieve specific goals and tasks through flexible adaptation. So there are three components that are salient here. One is big data, of course. Uh, the algorithms that train on that data and uh, machine learning. So without going, uh, making it sound like a, a lecture class, um, and we have all, I, I'm hoping that most of us read about those concepts and they are well explained in the paper, I'll get to the interesting part, which is what is different now? Um, we think that there are three key features that are different and that, uh, why we need the governance of this particular technology. One is scale and velocity. So the scale at which data is being churned, being collected and processed is, um, is exponential. The second is self-learning algorithms. So uh, differentiating from the algorithms earlier, which were coded by programmers and these algorithms take a life of their own um, given the opacity. And that brings us to the third point, which is biasness and opacity. Um, there are a couple of examples here. Um, one of which is um, the Microsoft uh, chatbot Tay, which had, um, huge success in China, but when implemented here. So the reason it had to shut down in six hours. The reason for that was primarily it had, uh, the, the chatbot is designed in such a way it learned from users. And so their interactions would determine the outcomes of um, chatbots uh, eventual performance. And so, and there, the other examples of here are like uh, for example, Apple's credit card, which was rolled back because um, it would apparently learn from the biases that society presents today 
um, it learned from historical data that uh, the, uh, the credit limit for a particular gender is not as high as the other gender, which in this case was the female gender. And the husband and wife complained uh, about this, but given that their assets um, and their spending patterns were both very similar and very alike, um, it very quickly more such complaints started to come in. So basically the, the point, the larger point I'm trying to make is that uh, these technologies are uh, as interesting and as fascinating as they are, can have unintended outcomes and which we need to um, be accountable for. The, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that Ruth is not here with us, but I'll try and explain to the best of my capability. The informal and formal rules of how AI operates and specifying who is accountable for what is the, uh, is the definition that we have come up with for as a broader framework for governance of AI. This includes self-governance, corporate governance, sectoral governance in um, IT firms, as well as transnational governance, given the nature of this phenomena um, that, is, um, that we are experiencing today. Main objectives of our work are threefold. So we wanted to take stock of the literature about what has been done in our field, where are the gaps, and what should future research focus on? I'll quickly take you through the methodology. We identified 21 um, top management journals in our field, management and strategy journals, and added two more uh, governance journals. The keywords and criteria we used here were algorithms, big data, and AI, uh, either in the abstract or author supplied keywords. And we have, um, we have um, the time period for the, for our, we, that we selected was from 2000 onwards to September 2020. Um, these three keywords, algorithms, big data, and AI are not just conceptually related, but also because strategically when we used just artificial intelligence, we, uh, we would actually, we, we find um, that there are very few articles that mention AI in their abstract and keywords. And so we are still at our early stages of um, writing about this topic in our field. And hopefully you would agree. So we, uh, we scanned these articles, we excluded those that did not discuss these three as uh, a phenomena, rather they used them as a methodology. And finally, we have, as of um, today, we have 50 articles, which are likely to increase because we are yet to include some articles from post September um, that we have identified. So, um, and, and we added 19 from snowballing. Quickly, the trends uh, here, better represented in a graph, um, are that we have more conceptual articles um, than empirical work, and which is some, which is one of the future research directions that we are trying to, um, we, we are trying to propose. The the fact that we have uh, more theory work, theoretical work is uh, is actually encouraging, but we are also uh, looking forward to more empirical work on this on the uh, on these three topics. So in terms of level of analysis, um, we have form uh, not so surprisingly form as the major unit of analysis uh, across this literature. There are three th there are eight themes that we finally uh, arrive at. We did a three, first, second, and third order analysis, and uh, finally there are eight themes that we think are salient. And this work uh, this work. Uh, body of work can be classified into. And we find that um, organizational outcomes of algorithmic decision making, as this is one of the themes that we classified into, is one of the largest. And governance of AI, which to our mind is one of the more salient uh, themes, is one of the least spoken about uh, topics. Um, very quickly, I will uh, probably not have time to cover each theme, but we, um, uh, Professor Chaudhary is also here and we have, um, he used his work and uh, his co-authors work as example, but I'm just going to um, speak about the, th the theme that we find most salient, um, which is who, so basically the uh, governance of AI, the questions that are asked in this particular theme are who is responsible for AI? How do we regulate this technology, which um, let alone 
you know, politicians, let alone the, the, the policy makers and uh, scholars like us fully understand, but not even the experts, uh, given the opacity of algorithms, especially in um, unsupervised algorithms experience, who will guard the gods themselves? This is about the national, at the, at the national level. Uh, and speaking about the Orwellian state that uh, might become. And how, do uh, how does technology um, manifest itself in ways that are not controllable by humans and by our current forms of governance? And how do technology companies gain informed consent uh, for personal use of, uh, for, for data from um, personal use? Uh, so property rights issues there. Um, we find that there are five emerging tensions in the governance of this increasingly digital world that we are part of. And um, going from a macro scale to micro in the direction or uh, in the opposite direction of the arrow, the first trade-off or the first tension that we discuss is regulation versus innovation. So for a better innovation output, does society need more regulation and data protection? Or do we need, need a more incentivized open digital economy? The second trade-off um, that we discuss is reforming versus strengthening a surveillance state. This is about the tension that I spoke about, uh, that I, we just covered briefly before about being an Orwellian state. So should the state be empowered to carry out surveillance or should we protect our um, you know, citizens' privacy? The third tension or trade-off is distributed versus focused responsibility, which is does distributed responsibility amount to no responsibility in the existing corporate governance frameworks. Companies versus consumer rights. So does do consumers' right to data ownership and privacy come with the service providers? This is a, companies like Fagma, like Facebook, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, their right to denial of services. This is again about the property rights issue as well as about the service rights. So algorithmic efficiency versus traceability, this is at a very individual level. So should programmers favor the use of algorithms that promise higher accuracy, which is reinforcement learning, unsupervised learning and neural networks, but result in unexplainable or unanticipated outcomes. And these are all, uh, we present these as binary choices. And I understand that this is not a dichotomous world that we live in. It's uh, definitely not an either or question, but we present it in such a framework so as to you know, um, help us all understand and uh, realize that there is a trade-off here to make. And the, uh, the answer to all of these questions or some of these questions will not probably lie in either extreme it will probably be in sometimes in the middle and sometimes closer to one end and sometimes closer to the other. And we are fully cognizant of that, but this, uh, this trade-off just helps us understand uh, what are some trade-offs that we are going to uh, make in the process of um, increasing our digitalization in the society, in, um, in firms, in industries, as well as at a national scale. Um, very quickly wrapping up the future research questions uh, we, we propose four directions. The first one is social power of algorithms. So what are some social costs of staying away from networking platforms? Whom should the society favor when there is a power imbalance uh, due to data capitalism? Uh, such questions would fall under this category. The next category is future of job quality. The quality of jobs, how happy are employees who code? Uh, how can we in increase their workforce satisfaction? The emergence of novel occupations and roles. These are part. These are some questions that um, we we propose as um, our second category of future directions. The third one is human algorithm collaboration. This is about augmented capacity to um, to process data. This is about augmented capacity to perform uh, to to make decisions in organizations. So what is the true value that users derive from AI services that they don't pay for? Also, this is about uh, forming human AI teams. And lastly, um, governance of AI, which is who is accountable, who is responsible for AI, what, proce what processes can be designed to increase accountability. 
from developers, managers, users to firms, industry, and country level. Uh, lastly, I think for all of for all the four, we need further we need a theory development as well as more empirical research and including more novel ways to um, to investigate AI and also to investigate the repercussions of AI. In this case, we are particularly uh, looking forward to see more work on the governance of AI. And um, I will leave you with this quote and I'm um, very happy to take questions. Thank you, Deepika. Any questions? Well, if not, thank you for having me and um, I look forward to the other presenters work. Thank you. Thank you, Deepika. So we'll have Abraham for his paper on platform and ecosystem. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, good day, good afternoon, good evening. I'm not really sure to all, all, all of you around the world. Uh, my name is Abraham Song. And um, yeah, I just wanna thank the organizers for having us uh, as part of the Global Strategy and Emerging Markets Conference tonight. Um, and it's also a distinct honor for us to be nominated for the best paper award in this conference. So uh, the title of uh, the paper and today's presentation is The Platform Economy, Multi-Sided Platforms, and Platform-Based Ecosystems. It's a mouthful. Um, <clears throat> and I'll um, try to uh, hash out each concept through this uh, presentation. It's co-authored work with Zoltanaj, Lazo Serb, um, uh, Eva Komlosi and uh, David Aldridge. So um, the motivation behind uh, this uh, study is really to, um, based on the, the observation of the proliferation of digital technologies, big data, new algorithms, cloud computing, and how they're creating a digital platform economy built around platform companies and their ecosystems. Some of the most salient ones are, um, you see the logos, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, each with a market cap of a trillion or $2 trillion. And so these uh, businesses, these platform businesses are really unique in that their value proposition extends far beyond just sale of goods or services, but it's based on their network effects and bundle of services offered through their ecosystems. So we were fascinated by this um, phenomenon and wanted to introduce a conceptual framework to better understand entrepreneurship and innovation in the digital age. We spent uh, the last two, three years thinking about this and we're really um, happy to present and um, get comments or uh, questions from you guys. Um, we also tried to attempt uh, to visualize this uh, global platform economy by really identifying the key firms and actors uh, of this new uh, um, economy. So um, the motivating example that I, I wanna share with you is the Apple's unlikely success story. Um, what I mean by that is um, back in 2007, prior to the introduction of the iPhone, the smartphone industry was well protected by five major mobile phone um, uh, companies, Nokia, Samsung, Motorola, Sony Ericsson, and LG. They collectively controlled 90% of the industry's global profits. And this was you know, strong product differentiation, trusted brands, leading operating systems, on and on and on. But fast forward to uh, 2015, um, and iPhone generated 92% of global profits. What happened here? What can explain this? Um, there was a shift in the game. 
Um, Stephen Elab, the former CEO of Nokia, observed very much on point. Our competitors aren't taking our market share with devices. They are taking our market share with an entire ecosystem. What is Apple's ecosystem? So Apple became a multi-sided platform, um, attracting users to their um, uh, service platform, attracting developers to increase platform value. And they became a kind of, a, you know, a reducing transaction costs for all its users and developers and orchestrating rather than accumulating capital. So they created a platform-based ecosystem uh, by attracting the users and developers. And uh, their value creation was now based on network effects and a bundle of services within their ecosystem. Uh, what I mean by platform-based uh, ecosystem is basically a uh, multi-sided platform, uh, Apple, uh, and then the users, and then the app developers. So Apple's ecosystem today is uh, um, 20 million uh, uh, developers and 500 million uh, users. And so in the App Store, the App Store really elevates the role of app developers and users. And um, our observation is that we have to really understand now and factor in app developers and users when we think about entrepreneurship. Um, and of course, the uh, multi-sided platform. So a key uh, implications, right? The platform-based ecosystems create entrepreneurial opportunities. Um, Tom Goodwin observed that these companies, uh, meaning the app developers that create apps that's uh, right here, are indescribably thin layers that sit on top of vast supply of systems where the costs are and interface with a huge number of people where uh, the money is. So they create entrepreneurial opportunities. Um, uh, Mark Andreessen, right, one of um, well-known venture capitalists, uh, he says that in the 90s, if you wanted to build an internet company or startup, you need to buy Sun servers, Cisco networking gear, Oracle databases, EMC storage systems. The new startups today uh, pay somewhere between 100 times and 1,000 times less per unit of compute, per unit of storage, per unit of networking. So in, in some sense, entrepreneurial costs have gone down as a result of the app store. Of course, uh, it's a mixed bag. Uh, Platform-based ecosystems have its drawbacks too. Um, maybe startup costs have not necessarily decreased but changed from uh, labor and capital costs to um, the user acquisition costs, which range somewhere between 3.5 to $80 uh, for, um, for, for one person. Um, also, uh, entrepreneurs became more platform dependent Right, so Apple has its Apple tax, which is 30 percent of uh, sales on its platform, and some in some ways competition has intensified for small players because now you're not just competing with your local market players but global market players. Right, so in some sense, competition has become more Trumpetarian, where businesses can scale up quickly, gain dominant market share, but at the same time, they can be supplanted by competitors at a faster pace. So we, we wanted to pull these phenomena together into a conceptual framework. So we want to situate digital entrepreneurship in a broader context of users, digital platforms, and digital infrastructures. And we have a few studies uh, that we have published. Um, so this is just kind of the conceptual framework I'm talking about. Um, there are digital users, there are digital entrepreneurs, meaning uh, app developers, and then there's the multi-sided digital platforms and then there's digital infrastructure. This is uh, cloud computing. This is um, uh, the broadband towers uh, and all the enabling technologies. So companies that work on that. So the, the green shaded ones, right? Users, entrepreneurs, and the platforms, they make up the platform-based ecosystem. And what we mean by the digital platform economy is the whole thing, right? Including the digital infrastructure firms. And uh, we try to kind of think a little bit deeper in, about each one. Right? So for example, digital platforms, you can 
uh, distinguish between transaction platforms where it's really about reducing transaction costs between connecting users to users or users to um, uh, sellers or innovation platforms where you bring in um, uh, app developers. Um, users, there are uh, users on the demand side and on the supply side. And then uh, entrepreneurs, there are also process innovation entrepreneurs and product innovation entrepreneurs. And obviously in the digital infrastructure, there are communication services, equipment and telecommunication services. So um, in, in our paper, we really identify, uh, I think more deeply about each, uh, each quadrant and sub quadrants and try to identify who the major players are and the actors are. Um, but uh, here, uh, basically, we lay out kind of the interaction between uh, each quadrant. Um, and and, and, and in, a, in a way, these arrows um, depict what uh, the relationship and the interactions are in this digital platform economy. Uh, but since I don't have that much time, um, I would like to just uh, go to the visualization piece of how um, these uh, players uh, look in uh, this uh, global economy. So um, this is how we uh, visualize the landscape of um, uh, the platform economy. And the, the, you know, uh, each bubble uh, is really market cap um, and uh, it's divided by um, continents. And what the first observation is that the big players are in US and Asia. Right, there's the GAFAMs, right? Uh, Google, Apple, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Microsoft in the US. And then there's um, uh, Baidu, there's Alibaba, Tencent uh, in Asia, Samsung as well. Um, <clears throat> and then there's a platform vacuum in a way in Europe and uh, obviously in Africa. Um, so, so some concluding thoughts here. Um, so the battle for digital supremacy in this digital platform economy appears to be uh, really becoming a struggle between the US platforms, um, the GAFAMs with the China's platforms, the BATs they're called. Um, so BATs and GAFAMs are competing for the consumer markets, the users in India, in Indonesia, in Brazil, and other emerging economies. And I think this is an important um, trend for uh, us scholars to uh, really uh, key into. And um, I think uh, this will uh, really blow up in the next few years, um, perhaps a decade of uh, who is gonna really be able to capture the users. Um, at the moment, uh, the US platforms appear to have a lead over Chinese in terms of uh, app developers, right? The App Store and the Android um, have uh, attracted developers. Uh, but the question is whether it will be able to maintain that lead. So these are some of uh, my thoughts uh, that uh, uh, came out uh, as we um, uh, pursued this research topic. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Abraham. Any questions? Yes, I have uh, two questions, actually. One is regarding uh, social media. Actually, there is a Chinese social media that is TikTok that has become global in very quickly in, in all over Europe, US. It's probably the only one Chinese that has taken over the world. That's one thing. And then another question is regarding Apple. Uh, Apple used to dominate the smartphone, but if we look at the market share, uh, uh, Apple right now is number three. Actually, Huawei has overtaken Apple as number two. So now we have Samsung, Huawei, Apple, and all the rest are Chinese or LG from Korea. So, uh, do, and in fact, that has uh, triggered uh, Apple to uh, offer uh, smartphones at a cheaper price, which is very interesting. And so this, how do you see the future? Yes, Apple has captured a lot of the profits, but how do you see the future with these tremendous uh, competitors? We have the folding from, uh, from uh, folding smartphone from Samsung, then now Huawei has also a folding phone. It seems 
when you wear a, an iPhone outside the US, people look at you and say, what are you doing? You are paying more for a less quality product. Thank you so much for um, a very important uh, question. So, I mean, obviously this is a really hot topic right now with uh, TikTok um, uh, and uh, its operations in the US kind of being uh, banned and then uh, parts of it being sold to uh, Oracle, I believe. Um, I think the important piece is, uh, which we see here uh, in the competition and the strategy, again, as I've said in my presentation, is the users and then the app developers. So whichever platform that's able to secure uh, the most users and app developers, the best users, uh, meaning the most lucrative, and then the, the best app developers uh, appears to have the best um, ecosystem. In other words, best value creation, uh, meaning that it will be able to create the best value appropriation. Um, at the moment, TikTok is more of a transaction platform than a, um, a full-on uh, um, hybrid platform, what it's called, right? So it has users, but also has app developers. Um, so in that sense, I'd say that it's less of um, uh, kind of the major player uh, in terms of competition than say uh, Apple or Google. Um, in terms of um, Apple becoming third in terms of device sales to Huawei and Samsung, um, I would say that uh, the, um, that again is speaking about uh, users. And um, most of the growth in Huawei and Samsung may be in the developing countries, but Apple really has a secure grip on the, the North America and the European markets and more of the developed uh, world uh, markets. Again, what I want to emphasize again and again is that Apple and Google have really created an amazing value through their ecosystem. And um, once um, Android was banned uh, from being used by Huawei, that became a big uh, a question mark, whether they'll be able to compete the Chinese uh, mobile device companies, because they're more of hardware companies than um, service providers. Thank Not you. anymore. Huawei during the trade war has moved from number three to number two. So there is no bad publicity. So Huawei is growing and really outside the US, uh, outside the US, uh, I think is losing, but it's okay for another time. Sorry. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, oh, I, I, one if, uh, I can have a chance. Uh, Abraham, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, congratulations on the uh, candidate paper, another good one. Um, show, go back to your title page, because the title page seems to be different from the one we have on the program. Can you show your, because you also said you, the title is like a mouthful. So I do just have a comment to help you shorten the title. So you have the platform economy, multi-sided platforms. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. I believe this is the same one. The digital on the program is the digital entrepreneurial eco ecosystem. Ah, ah, yeah. So we changed that to e more more into um, established literature where it talks about platform-based ecosystem. We wanted to kind of ground it more into the platforms literature. Okay, so anyway, my suggestion based on the slide in front of us, uh, this you, you, you already said this is a tongue twister, right? With the word platform. Yes. So my suggestion is just to use the last two, platform okay. based the ecosystems. Mm -hmm. To me, that is summarizing everything you're doing. I see. Okay, thank you it's very much. That's a, that's a good idea, yeah. Right? So the rest is the rest. So that, that's all, I think uh, the paper is great, but if you can shorten your title, the impact and the effectiveness will actually be better in my view. That's all. Thank you very much, Professor Peng. Any further questions? Any further questions? Okay, so actually, uh, unfortunately, one of our presenters could not come today. So we have only like two presentations for this session. We will end our plenary session a bit earlier. And for the rest uh, of us, 
let's move on to different uh, parallel roundtable discussions, and we will join in, uh, in different Zoom links. And the Zoom link will uh, will start at 9:30, so you can click uh, uh, in different like uh, respective Zoom links to join different roundtable discussions led by different co-chairs. So, and then our plenary session will remain. So, if you have any questions, you can stay here and we can talk. Okay. So let's have a short break, and then probably our roundtable discussions will begin uh, nine at nine fifty.